Hey there, welcome to this video where I'm going to take a deep dive into different types of mushroom substrate. All right, so we can see on the screen here a wide variety of different substrate materials that can all be used to grow mushrooms on. And really, this is just a very small selection of the hundreds of different substrate materials that you can grow mushrooms on. During this video, I'm going to go through quite a few different options that are most commonly used for growing mushrooms and also just explain a little bit about, you know, what you're looking for in a mushroom substrate and that will help you to work out what's going to be the right substrate in your situation. So towards the end of this video, I'll show you a couple of my favorite substrate recipes that work in different situations. But let's kick it off by just taking a, a look at what exactly is mushroom substrate. Well, mushroom substrate really is the material that you are looking to fruit your mushrooms from. So in contrast to further back in the growing process where you're producing maybe uh, mushroom spawn, first of all on agar and then on to grains, mushroom substrate is the final material that is going to support a, a big mass of oyster mycelium that's then able to produce a nice big crop of mushrooms from. And it tends to be a material that is dense in lignin, cellulose and hemicellulose. So these are kind of woody, fibrous materials that contain a lot of uh, carbon. And this is the main food source for the mycelium as it grows across the substrate. But it also needs to have a few other things. For example, a small amount of nitrogen in the range of about one to two percent. Now, some materials naturally have higher levels of nitrogen in them. For example, anything that is a seed um, or part of a seed tends to be fairly high in, in protein and therefore nitrogen. Um, but most substrates, when they come as their base, you know, for example, sawdust or straw, are going to have slightly lower amounts of nitrogen than this. And so often you'll find um, there is additional materials added to a substrate to increase the levels of nitrogen. We'll come back and talk about that in just a minute because um, by adding more nitrogen to the substrate, you tend to increase the chances of competing organisms thriving in that substrate as well. So it's one of those choices when you come to choosing a substrate, um, it's something you need to consider. We'll come back and talk about that in just a minute. So the other thing that the substrate needs to contain is small amounts of a few different minerals that are particularly important for uh, the production of enzymes that the mycelium uses in order to uh, extract uh, food from its substrate source. So we, we're looking at uh, minerals like magnesium, potassium, uh, calcium, sulfur. Um, these are all really important. They doesn't need it in huge amounts and you tend to find that most materials have sufficient uh, quantities of them in the raw substrate material. But again, it depends on so many different factors, you know, where the plant material was grown, what kind of soil it was grown in, uh, the growing environment. So it does vary from place to place. Um, you know, if you get your straw from one source, it won't necessarily have the same makeup of minerals or nitrogen even as it will from another place. And so this is something people generally just need to experiment with when they're choosing their substrate as to whether they need to add any additional supplementation. Um, you also are looking for a pH level slightly acidic range, you know, around about 5 to 6.5 pH is the ideal pH level for most substrates. Um, some mushrooms, for example, oyster mushroom can tolerate higher pH levels up around seven or eight. Um, and that's actually one of the things we utilize in low tech mushroom farming. Um, we'll come and talk about that again in a minute when we touch on pasteurization. Another really important thing about the substrate is it needs to have good structure to enable air exchange. Um, one of the main problems you can face, particularly if you're working with non-sterilized substrates, if you have very fine particle size, something like uh, sawdust, for example, often is very small particle size. If you grow it in larger bags, you'll tend to find you get compaction and you get very poor air exchange to the middle of the substrate. And when that happens, you tend to get anaerobic conditions inside the substrate, which favors the growth of competing bacteria over the growth of your mycelium. Mycelium uses oxygen in the process of its growth. It expels CO2. Um, and so it needs to have good air exchange throughout the substrate in order uh, to colonize well. Now, when you're working with sterilized substrates, you can actually get away with having less than optimal structure in the substrate. 
because there's an absence of competing organisms and the spawn will grow through it, albeit more slowly. But one of the things we really look to get absolutely right when you're growing in a low-tech, non-sterile way is to have good structure in the substrate and it creates a much quicker spawn run and it really favors the growth of your mycelium over competing organisms. You're also gonna need then moisture inside the substrate. Mushrooms are 90% water. And you tend to find that um, most substrates reach their capacity at between 50 and 70% hydration level, um, depending on the size of the particles. So for example, something very fine particle like sawdust or coffee grounds uh, can become saturated around about 50 to 55% quite low, uh, whereas something like straw, which is larger uh, pieces, can hold a lot more moisture, up to around about 70 or even 75%, depending on the type of straw. Um, this is something that you uh, test based on the material that you're using, but you're looking to get it somewhere in that region. You wanna make sure it's not too wet. If it's too wet, you tend to get very slow, poor growth, and it promotes uh, competing organisms inside the substrate instead. And on the other hand, if it's too dry, you get really weak mycelium that um, is very thin and wispy and very low poor yields. Then finally, the last thing then that you're gonna want in your substrate is an absence of competing organisms. And people often ask, you know, why do you need that? Mushrooms don't have that in the wild. Yeah, that's true, but in the wild, what you're looking at there is billions of spores that are released into the environment. And of those, only a small handful actually find, you know, the right conditions in which they can thrive. When you're working with um, cultivation techniques, you really to guarantee that it's going to work on a consistent basis. You want to get rid of any competing organisms that also want to grow on whatever substrate it is that you're uh, working with. You know, that nutrition in the substrate and that moisture is a breeding ground for all sorts of different organisms that often grow faster than your mycelium. Uh, and so you really want to just get rid of those so that you can kind of provide a blank canvas for your uh, mushroom mycelium to thrive. Um, and so that brings us to this topic then, which I'm going to make a separate video about another time because it's a question we often get and there's actually quite a lot of detail to go into it. But just very basically then, there's a choice to be made as to whether you're going to sterilize your substrate or pasteurize your substrate. And sterilization is a more thorough process. It happens at a higher temperature of around about 121 degrees Celsius, that's 250 Fahrenheit. Um, and at that temperature, you're going to kill all living organisms on the substrate completely. So that after that, you've got a substrate that you can add your spawn to and it has no competitors whatsoever. Um, and that enables you to add higher levels of nitrogen to the substrate and get higher yields because of that. Now, there are a load of downsides to that. You need a lot of additional equipment. You need to learn sterile processes and aseptic techniques. Um, it tends to be a bit more costly and time consuming as well when you're working with larger amounts of substrate. Um, anyway, like I said, we'll talk about that in more detail in another video. The other option you have then is pasteurization, which um, is either done by temperature, you know, at a lower temperature of about 60 to 85 Celsius, that's 140 to 185 Fahrenheit. Uh, that's kind of may maybe one of the more common methods is just soaking your uh, substrate material in a hot water bath for one hour, and that will kill off most of the organisms living on it, but it will leave behind some uh, that are able to, to survive that temperature range. Um, and so beyond the pasteurization process, they tend to still be on the substrate and they actually kind of protect the substrate for the first seven days or so of incubation whilst the mycelium grows across it. So you can kind of think of them almost as like friendly uh, organisms that don't compete with your mushroom mycelium. Um, they kind of protect the substrate from other uh, microorganisms that might want to grow on it. Um, and allow it the chance to colonize. Um, and so this is a really easier way, I suppose, of starting to grow without needing as much equipment, because not only can you do it with hot water, but you can also use various other methods to pasteurize a substrate. Um, one of the other more common methods that we use is a high pH water bath. And with that, you're basically soaking the material inside of uh, water that's been brought up to you know, high pH of about 12. Uh, using um, hydrated lime or wood ash um, and that kills off most of the competing organisms uh, leaves behind a few that can survive the high pH level 
Um, and then after pasteurization, you've got a substrate that's relatively clean that you can use. So we'll get into that in more detail in a separate video. Let's move on and have a look at some of the popular substrate options, um, some things that you might want to think about that you could use. So really, there are different ways to approach what kind of substrate you need, and it depends on lots of different factors, like the, the mushroom variety that you want to grow, uh, the type of uh, substrate that you've got available to you. Um, it could depend really on whether you decide you're going to pasteurize or, or sterilize. So let's just walk through some of the more common materials. Uh, straw is a material that we work with a lot. Um, it can be all sorts of different straw. It could be wheat straw, oat straw, rye straw, rice straw. Uh, basically, the end result of cereal crop production, you often end up with the, the long shafts of um, woody, dense, fibrous material that's left behind and that can be shredded up into small pieces uh, you know one to three inches in size uh, pasteurized and then used as a substrate most commonly for oyster mushrooms but also other varieties like uh, the piopino um, the sometimes you can grow king oysters on them and also shiitake uh, so straw can be quite a versatile substrate if you choose the right strains in which to grow on it. Likewise, there's a whole range of other agricultural byproducts that you can use as substrate, um, you know, ranging from banana leaves to cocoa, uh, waste from the production of cocoa and coffee, uh, sunflower seeds, soybean holes, corn cobs, a um, whole range of different things. There's more than 200 or so uh, substrate options like this that are basically waste products from um, various agricultural uh, crops which usually have little or no value but um, they provide you know ideal uh, food source really for your mushroom mycelium so I really encourage people wherever they are in the world to look around at what um, agricultural byproducts they have near to them um, and to think about how they could utilize that I've been in touch with people around the world the people inside of our course using uh, sugarcane bagasse for example uh, sugar beet pellets sunflower husks um, there's a whole range of different materials you can use and um, it really makes use of this material and usually you can just pasteurize these materials to grow certainly oyster mushrooms on um, and in other cases you can use them as a supplement uh, alongside more of a wood-based substrate for other varieties like you know if you want to grow a lot of uh, different gourmet species you might look to do that instead moving on then to sawdust sawdust is one of the most commonly used materials for growing um, gourmet varieties of mushrooms on usually it's supplemented because sawdust on its own doesn't contain very much nitrogen and so on its own it can work as a substrate you get lower yields but it's much easier to work with unsupplemented you don't need to sterilize it you can just pasteurize it uh, but many people who are kind of looking more towards commercial cultivation will be really looking to try and maximize the yield from the space that they have available to, to grow the mushrooms in. And so they tend to look at supplementing sawdust with additional materials like uh, bran or uh, the holes of different um, seeds like soybean holes, for example, uh, or, or rice bran. These are common, commonly added to sawdust to increase the nitrogen levels, but when you do that, you then need to sterilize the material um, because the higher levels of nitrogen tend to invite more contamination. When you're looking at sawdust, ideally you want to be using hardwood sawdust. That's what most varieties, uh, gourmet mushrooms, like to grow on. Um, and you can look towards, you know, if you, if you have access in your local area to anywhere that uses kiln-dried sawdust or, or kiln dried wood chips this is a really ideal material for using without needing to sterilize it it's usually very very clean because it's already been uh, somewhat heat treated and dried out previously along a similar line then there's also sawdust pellets or straw pellets this is something we grow with a lot these days we grow with both sawdust and straw pellets um, we find them to be a really good material for low-tech non-sterile cultivation uh, and that's really because the, the process of making the pellets subjects the material to, to really high pressure and heat uh, and basically pasteurizes them in the production making the pellets and they're then kept really dry. So all you need to do actually is just add water to them um, to hydrate them and you can use it straight away. You then don't necessarily need to pasteurize them at all. You don't need to you know put them in a hot water bath or a lime bath. You can just add water, add your spawn, 
place it into your, your growing vessel and off you go. Um, we have a separate video about that actually, just the easiest way to grow mushrooms at home. Um, I'll put a link up here, you could go and check that out. If you just wanna get started on, on a small scale at home, I'd recommend growing on pellets, it's probably the, uh, the easiest way. Then we've got uh, manure, most commonly it's horse manure or cow manure. Um, now the types of mushrooms that like to grow on this are you know, traditional button mushrooms, so that would be kind of field mushrooms and uh, cremini mushrooms. Uh, but also there's a whole handful of other varieties that are manure based mushrooms, including a lot of the uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so with manure, there's a slightly different process. You, you have to kind of uh, go through two phases of composting, usually before using the material. Um, and usually it's pasteurized instead of uh, sterilized. Moving on then, we've also got a couple of other uh, varieties of substrate that are commonly used. One of them is uh, cocoa coir and vermiculite. And this would tend to be used for kind of home scale, non-commercial cultivation. Uh, it doesn't produce the best yields, uh, but it is nice and simple to, to use. You can just buy a block of cocoa coir, uh, add some hot water to it to break it up. Uh, and then you mix in some vermiculite and that just gives a bit better structure of the substrate, it aerates it a little bit. Um, and this is something if you just want to get going on a simple uh, basis with just things you can easily source, this is a good option, although it does produce fairly low yields. Coffee grounds then, that's a material that we've uh, been growing on a lot over the last, um, I don't know, five to seven years. Uh, we used to grow on a, on a mix that was very high in coffee grounds, around about 75% coffee grounds with 25% straw. Um, and people have said for years, you know, this isn't possible. It's just too rich to do in a non-sterile way. That wasn't what we found at all. Actually, we found if you if you have good substrate structure by adding the straw, uh, that coffee grounds can be a really good material as the as the bulk of the substrate. They tend to produce really high yields. You know, when you pick up the grounds, they're already uh, pasteurized by the brewing process. But you do need to use them very quickly within a day or so of uh, their brewing process. We usually say a maximum of 24 hours is the ideal window to make use of them. But you do have to have really good structure in the substrate. You need to make sure the grounds aren't too wet. Um, and then it can be a good option, especially if you're in an urban area with lots of access to coffee grounds. Likewise, for people in urban areas um, who maybe can't get hold of some of the other materials, cardboard is another option. Uh, cardboard obviously is you know derived from wood and it retains a lot of the carbon rich material in the cardboard, you do find it gives very low yields because you know, you've lost a lot of the other nutrients that's leached out in the process of making card. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it as a key part of your substrate. Uh, when we first started growing on coffee, we actually added in shredded card with the coffee to break up the density of it a bit. Um, we found reasonable success with that, although it was much better when we used straw in place of cardboard. But, you know, it's an option for people who are just looking to find some easy to use substrate near to them. And usually you can do it without even pasteurizing it. You just add water to the card um, and add your spawn and off you go. So just to talk briefly then about supplementation, because, you know, if you do want to move towards um, commercial cultivation, a lot of people will look to grow on supplemented sawdust substrate so that they can introduce more uh, nitrogen content to increase the yield of the mushrooms. And most commonly these materials are uh, bran or any kind of derivative of a seed. Um, so you can also buy it in pellets as well, pellet form. Quite often it's sold as animal feed, you know, with high protein content. Um, and this is ideal actually if you can source it in pellet form because like with the wood pellets, it's a relatively clean, already pasteurized material um, and you can just hydrate it and add it at uh, somewhere between 5 to 20% dry weight of your substrate as a supplement. Now the exact amount that you add is something that you're going to need to play around with a little bit. It differs a lot depending on what the material is, you know, what is the supplement material that you're adding. Um, and also whether you're pasteurizing or sterilizing. If you're not sterilizing, you can still add some supplementation, but you need to be careful not to add too much and you have to experiment a little bit, you know, from lower rates of, of 5%, 10%, uh, you know, just moving up slowly bit by bit to see at what point you start to see increased levels of contamination. But it is possible to do on a non-sterile substrate 
to add some form of supplementation, especially if you use pellets. Then other options which, you know, if you're not interested in ongoing production, if you just want to do it on a simple scale outside, maybe in a garden, you can also grow mushrooms on logs and the, the hardwood logs are, are a great substrate for that. And obviously in many places around the world, there's a lot of um, hardwood logs, very low value or easy to come by for free. So that's a great option if you just want to get something going in your garden. Likewise, wood chip beds, uh, which we have a separate video about, you can go and check out. A uh, really great use of wood chip, uh, very easy to do, um, pretty high success rate if you use something like King's Trefaria or oyster mushrooms. Uh, nice, easy thing to do at home just with an easily available wood chip substrate. So where does this leave you then? How do you decide on your substrate? Well, it really comes down to a few different key choices that you need to make. Um, it's not necessarily that one is more important than the other, but you want to think about things like, you know, how much time and money do you want to input into this? Uh, if you want to keep that input low, then you're going to look towards pasteurized substrates, not supplementing them, and then choosing the species that will grow on, on those substrates, like oyster mushrooms in particular. This is actually how we approach mushroom cultivation. Uh, you can see a separate video we have about what low-tech mushroom farming is. Um, but our approach is to minimize the, the time and money input and use the simplest methods. You can actually scale that up and also get pretty decent yields using that approach. And there are many commercial farms, especially in the, in the US, that operate on a very large scale, basically using the same model as this. And they might be producing five to 10,000 kilos of mushrooms a week at high output, um, but pretty low uh, time and money input. But if you decide that you want to do it on a commercial scale and you want to grow a wide range of different gourmet mushrooms, then you might look towards uh, supplemented materials and having a method to, uh, to steam sterilize the material in an autoclave or a pressure cooker um, or many different pressure cookers. And that will enable you to, to branch out into many different varieties of gourmet mushrooms. You might also approach it from the point of view of, well, what substrate is easily available to me? Uh, so, for example, we have some people in our course who are in countries where they can't easily source some of the materials we're talking about here. You know, sawdust isn't necessarily available or straw isn't available. Um, and so for them, they're making their whole decision on how they're going to grow mushrooms based on what is available for them to use. And in some cases, that's, uh, you know, just commonly common uh, crops in the area like banana plantations, uh, coconut, uh, koya or parts of coconut tree. And the other way you can look at it is, you know, what species do you want to grow? For many people, they'll just be really happy to grow a lot of different oyster mushrooms. You can grow different strains. Um, but if you're absolutely set on growing, you know, a wide range of gourmet and medicinal mushrooms, then you're going to choose your substrate in a different way. You're going to look more towards supplemented sawdust substrates. So here's a couple of options then, depending on which one of those paths you decide to go down in terms of uh, my favorite substrate formulas. So if you're looking at low-tech mushroom substrate, you look towards pasteurized substrates like straw, uh, chopped straw that is, or straw pellets, sawdust pellets, uh, just unsupplemented sawdust. You can use sugarcane mulch, coffee grounds, uh, and you can look towards using pellets um, if you're wanting to supplement and add a little bit more nutrition, something like uh, sugar beet pellets, for example, or soybean pellets. And you want to just keep the level of supplementation lower. So definitely below 20%. Um, and you need to experiment a bit to find the range somewhere between 5 and 20% that's going to work without, you know, it's going to give you an increase in yields, but without an increase in contamination rates. And if you're looking more towards supplemented sawdust to grow a wider range of mushrooms on a sterilized substrate, here's a couple of different mixes then. So traditionally supplemented sawdust substrate would be um, mainly sawdust, sometimes with some wood chips mixed in. So sometimes you'd have just, you know, 80% hardwood sawdust uh, with 18% bran and 2% gypsum. But actually a, a better mix is if you can mix in 20% wood chips with 60% sawdust, that creates a better structure, um, tends to result in faster colonization and higher yields. So this is a really good mix. You, what you would do is you'd make up the mix from dry ingredients, hydrate them, load them into cultivation bags, put them in your steam sterilizer um, and then at the end of that you can then inoculate them and they sort of grow uh, on from there. Likewise then there's a mix that's become more popular in recent years it's the master's mix uh, 
And this was developed by a guy called T.R. Davis, which some of you who watch the channel probably already know from Earth Angel Mushrooms. Um, he's got a great YouTube channel. Actually, go and check out uh, some of his videos. He has a larger scale commercial operation and he's developed this substrate mix, which is simply 50% hardwood sawdust pellets, 50% soybean pellets. Uh, it's a really high level of supplementation um, and it tends to result in really good yields. But of course, it does need to be sterilized and worked with in a sterile way in order to avoid those high levels of nutrition creating um, problems with contamination. So if you're in the US, you're pretty lucky that there is a company called Mushroom Media Online that actually sell bags of this uh, ready made up 50% oak pellets, 50% soy hulls. I'll put a link below this video, so go and check that out if you're interested in that. So we've covered a lot of ground here. There's a lot to take in. And what I want to leave you with really is just that, you know, there are lots of different ways of growing mushrooms, lots of different substrate materials that you can choose. And the way you approach it, you just need to think about what your aims are, what kind of a, a way of growing mushrooms do you want to take on based on what we've discussed here. If you want to learn more about low-tech mushroom farming, then check out the link I'm going to put below this video. Uh, where we have an ebook on how to set up a low-tech mushroom farm and if you've enjoyed this information please do su subscribe to the channel and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.